Hello friends, this is Pastor Ken Ortiz and here we are again at our regular midweek Bible study. But this week we're gonna do something a little bit different. For the past couple of years, we've been studying about the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. And uh, But when we come to this time of year, we usually you know, stop for the summer and then resume our study in the fall. And this fall, we're gonna do that again as we pick up with the patriarch Joseph. But because we're all still under the stay at home order and uh, we're finding ourselves uh, socially isolating or separating and distancing ourselves from each other. We're left with a situation where most of us are spending a significant amount of time with our families. And not surprisingly, this is creating some real challenges because we find that being around husbands and wives and children for extended periods of time begins to uh, bring to the surface things that otherwise we might be able to keep hidden. Uh, you know, there's some things that we just don't deal with because they're really not in our face. There's other things that we put up with because they happen occasionally, but they're not all there the all the time. 
But for many of us right now, this is becoming a, a kind of a, a continual rubbing. Uh, and even though Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends, some of us feel like rather than getting sharpened, we're getting ground down to the nubs and there is no real cutting edge in our life anymore. Part of this dynamic is what we're doing right now. I mean, it's caused by what we're doing right now that we have become increasingly people who relate to the world through screens. Uh, sociologists have been studying this, psychologists have been studying this for decades, where they find as we imp increase our screen time, we're losing our ability to really communicate and interact with other people effectively. Anything we do well, it's something that we do often. And so if we find ourselves in conversation a great deal of the time, we usually become much better conversationalists. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily a, a significantly talkative person, but we become better listeners and we become better speakers and communicators. We, By practice, we learn how to explain what we're thinking and what we're feeling. And yet we're in a time in our history where people are spending so much time communicating through a keyboard or through a text on a phone or a computer or an iPad or something of that nature. We're tweeting and we're Snapchatting and we're TikToking and on and on it goes with ways in which we interact with the world. Well, most of us know that's not really a fulfilling dynamic. Some people like it because it keeps messy relationships at a distance. But when you're married, that isn't possible. You know, I mean, you can't sit across the room and text each other on your phones before long. You'll throw your phones down and start yelling at each other. So the simple fact is that we find that we're losing the ability to really relate to one another as effectively as people were in the past. And in some major ways, this is contributing to the breakdown of the family, which in turn leads to a breakdown of society. Let me tie that in with something else, too, that I was just reading an article one of my staff members sent to me because I was complaining to him about Zoom meetings, you know, the Zoom app where you can have a bunch of people in a meeting together. And they said what people are experiencing now is Zoom fatigue. And he went on to explain, he said, the problem is that 85% of our communication is nonverbal. In other words, facial gestures, our actions, our body language. Uh, most of us are attuned to those dynamics, even though we've never been educated to look for them because we simply grew up in fam family dynamics or social relationships where we realize that people communicate by a roll of the eyes or a, a tilt of the head or a number of other ways that we can share or communicate ourselves to other people. And Zoom and, and, and uh, media like this isn't able to really grasp that. It doesn't really catch that. And so, you know, even now as I'm, you're watching me, I have no idea how you're reacting to anything I'm saying. You may be simply saying, turn that thing off. I can't listen to that blow hard for another minute. I mean, you know, you're tired of listening to windbags. I, I get it. But the simple fact is that we relate meaningfully when we have a conversation. And a conversation literally means that something that verses are taking communicating back and forth, con or between the two of us. We're engaging together in a life experience. And that's why even in, in older times, in old, older English, like King James English, the, the very word conversation meant to simply do life with other people. Uh, we've kind of shrunk it down to now we say we have a conversation, we're talking to somebody, but even now we're further removed because we're doing it through media, which hides a great deal of what we're really thinking or feeling. And so that makes the dynamic that we're in right now extremely challenging. And it's probably, you may be looking at your marriage and saying, I don't understand why I'm getting so irritated and angry and uptight with this other person. And part of that is, is that you're in a new dynamic. You're forced into a situation that you've never had to navigate before. You know, I was talking with one of my staff members who was recently member, married, and he was saying about how his wife was so excited about the stay at home because they could spend 24 hours today, a day together. And um, he warned her and, and proved true that it would be just a matter of time where she would be wishing he'd go back to work and not be at home. So this is kind of the reality of it because that takes a great deal of skill and development. Now, my wife and I are, are, are going to, in a few months, are going to celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. I mean, every time I think of that, I kind of, I didn't expect to live this long, much less to be married this long. But the thing is, uh, we find that even though we have learned to, to adjust and, and to meld ourselves together over the years as husband and wife, 
um, we still find getting testy and irritable with each other. And so I don't want you to feel like there's something terribly wrong with you. If you're going through really hard times in your relationship, it's in part because the intensity of the social dynamics we're in. But also, you need to see the positive side of this. Many of you are sitting saying, why God would you allow this to happen to me? And the answer may simply be because God wants you to learn how to love one another in a new and deeper way. Uh, the basic dynamic, and we'll talk about this further as we get into this series of messages, but you know, uh, Paul said, husbands love your wives and wives respect your husbands. Uh, those two issues are key. Men desperately want to be respected by their wives uh, more than they want to be loved by them. And, and wives want to be loved by their husbands in a sense more than they want to be respected. Now, I'm not saying that those things are mutually exclusive. Both things need to be there, but that very difference in, in primary need in the relationship kind of emphasizes the very real differences that exist between husbands and wives. I used to always say that uh, husbands and wives, are men and women are so different that they could be separate species except for their ability to procreate. And that's really when we call, we saying uh, there's a family of beings because they can intermarry or they can procreate and they can breed children or offspring. Uh, essentially, that's what makes us similar because we can, uh, we can become one flesh. And, and part of that whole idea of one fleshness is the idea that together we produce this offspring, which is not just of one of us, but it's of both of us. But the simple fact of the matter is, we are very different. We see the world from extremely different lenses. And as we go on, I'll continue to try to persuade you by, not by the popular rhetoric we hear out there in the culture today, which is so stupid, I don't know how else to explain it. It's like, it's being, you know, it's pretty, I would say, to be kind, it's moronic, you know? It's just moronic because we know that men are women. We, men are men and women are women. We know, <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> we know that they are distinct genders and, and there's only two of them. And there is no third, fourth, or fifth option. But aside from that, where we need to begin our understanding of how to relate to each other isn't from the signals that we get from the culture. The culture is, is moving rapidly away from the biblical foundations. And it's my firm belief, and I think that it's supported by the factual realities, that the Bible provides us a foundation upon which we can build not only a, a godly life, but we can build relationships. Because here's the thing that's really important to keep in mind. Relationships are really the key of what it means to be a Christian. I mean, think about it for a moment. We often find in the scriptures that God is described in what we call a, a trinity of being, a, a triunion. The fact that there are three persons of the Godhead. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting is that God was created in communion or with fellowship with himself. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have this relationship between them. These three are one, but yet they live in this distinct personalities of relationships with one another. And is it surprising that God created man, that he created us for relationship? Let me begin by reading it from the text itself, where we read in Genesis chapter 2, where God is speaking about the creation of man and woman. And he says, as for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. In other words, of all the creatures that God had created upon the planet, there was none of them that enabled Adam to have the same kind of intimacy of relationship that God intended. Now, I know some people say, well, my closest friend is my pet. And if that's what you really believe, then I feel very sorry for you because you're basically saying, I only want to be in a relationship where I am the dominant figure and the other one has to submit to my will completely. The simple fact of the matter is there needs to be an interchange, an equality, if you will, of relationship. And that's where sometimes in this day of equality and so forth, we get confused because the Bible doesn't describe an unequal relationship between husband and wife. It talks about an equal relationship. What it does separate, though, is that man is not the same as woman. So sameness 
is a different issue than equality, so that men and women are not the same, but they are co-equal in the eyes of God. And that's why God says he looked at Adam and there was nobody co-equal to him. There was nobody who could feel that kind of kinship and connection and relationship and, and familial bond that is really key to what it means to live a fulfilled life. You know, it's I, 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 have, I travel a lot. I've traveled a lot over the years all over the world. And, and many times I've had to travel long distances by myself. And, you know, I've been to these amazing cities around the world. I, I mean, you go to places like Paris and London and Amsterdam and, and uh, Prague and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, I mean, these, Italy, Rome and so forth. These are these amazing places. But when you're there alone, it's not the same. And I used, whenever I got a chance to go someplace that's really special, like Budapest or something like that, I'll say to my wife, you have to go with me on this trip because we're going to see this amazing stuff and I don't want to see them alone. And, you know, I don't even feel like taking pictures with my phone because, again, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's so wonderful to share life with someone else. That's why uh, someone, there was an essay in a London paper many years ago that asked the question, what's the shortest distance between London and York, two different cities in England? And uh, they had all these submissions. They had, they had to say it, explain it in 25 words or less. And the winning submission was one of the shortest. It said the shortest distance from London to York is a good companion. And haven't you noticed that? Haven't you experienced that in your life when you go on a journey and you have this great conversation with the other person and it seems like the trip is so short? Well, it, the time was the same, but the experience of time was different. And because we live in a, in a time continuum, if you will, in this world, it's our experience of time that really makes the difference between whether our life is joyful or unfulfilling. There's nothing more painful than to be alone except for one other thing, and that's to be alone in a relationship. And that's where you find the relationship is separated. There's conflict, and that is the loneliest person in the world. When you're married to someone whom you can't relate to, you can't connect with, that you don't feel you have a real bond or a oneness, that is the loneliest place in the world to be. And the reason is because later on in chapter, or earlier in chapter 2, 18, God said to Moses, uh, excuse me, said to, uh, yeah, said to Moses who wrote the book, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. So that aloneness is the most painful thing that we can experience. You know, if you're sick and you're going through difficult times, uh, it's a terrible thing to be alone. I, I think about people I know who have had surgeries during this crisis or this uh, pandemic. We can debate whether it's faux or not. But nonetheless, during this pandemic, they've gone into for surgery and their whole family has been kept out. They have no one who can sit with them in the recovery room or be with, be with them while in the hospital. That's a, a painful, painful reality because at our base, we are made for relationship. Yeah, I know there's people who are hermits, people who like to recluse and not be around people. And and this gets into some dynamics about, you know, whether you're a singular relational purpose person or a multi-relational person or ambi-relational person. We'll, we'll get into talking about those kind of dynamics in the future. But the simple fact is, even if you're a person who likes a lot of private and quiet time, you don't like that quiet and private time all the time forever, unless... Somewhere in your life, you experienced an incredibly painful trauma and you decided, you kind of made a, a vow or a promise to yourself in your own mind, I'll never allow myself to be in that vulnerable situation again. Then maybe you withdraw and you, then you begin to try to find that fulfillment in some kind of activity or even in some, your, your obsession with your pets and your animals and things of that nature. And I'm not criticizing people who like animals. I love dogs, but I never want to be married to one. But the simple thing is, <laughs> I guess I better watch out what I'm saying here. <laughs> but anyway, the simple fact of the matter is that God created us for relationship. And so Adam couldn't find anything that satisfied him. And that's why the text goes on. It says, so God caused Adam to go into a deep sleep. And uh, he goes on to say that he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, 
She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. And he says it's for this reason that a man will leave his father and his mother and he'll be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Um, I have about four Bible studies that I can teach out of that one passage, and maybe that's what we'll end up doing. But I think it's really what's really critically important to hear is to see that God essentially says that woman came out of man, that we are so close biologically that we're able to not only procreate, but we understand each other's vibrations, if you will. There's a communication that takes place. And it's one of those kind of funny things that I can pick up my wife's vibrations across the room. If I'm beginning to act or do something that she isn't happy with, she hardly has to make a gesture and I get the message loud and clear, light and wide away. There's this ability to interact with other people. And this is why when we talk about um, doing things like this, one of the problems with this is what they recently called Zoom fatigue. Um, somebody was... I was sharing with one of my staff members how I hate doing Zoom meetings because we're doing them. And I, I found that I don't like them because they don't feel very interactive to me. Um, and it, it's really kind of a, a frustrating thing because you can't look at the people you're talking to. You can't, you can't read their, their body language. And let, let me be even more transparently honest. One of the hardest things of doing things like this where there's nobody in the room is the fact that when you're preaching to an audience, you can see whether or not people are following what you're saying or not, and you can communicate or adjust your communication accordingly. And what we find is that because 95 or excuse me, 85 percent of our communication is nonverbal, it's even the 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 look in our eye. You know, we say it sometimes say say a person is laughing, but their eyes aren't laughing. You can tell if somebody has a sincere laugh just by the way their eyes function. The people who make a laughing sound and yet don't laugh with their eyes, their eyes have a deadness to them. And the same thing is about every other part of your body language. I mean, you know, the way you sit, whether you're tapping your foot, whether you're moving around, it says something about what's going on inside of you and whether you're receptive or not receptive. In fact, there, uh, one, of the, one of the big researchers on relationships is the University of Washington. And one of the things they found was that body language, uh, if they videotaped the body language of a couple talking, they could predict whether or not their marriage would survive or not. And I'll explain why, what that means later on. But it's one of those things that we have to understand. This is a critical, important factor in learning how to relate to each other. And so the point is that Adam and Eve, you and me, we're pretty similar and we relate to each other, not just on a physical level, but even we send, if we can use the hippie term, we send vibrations. We send all sorts of signals, nonverbal signals to each other that communicate what we like, what we dislike, whether we're happy, whether we're sad. We all know this, we've all been aware of it, but maybe we've never pulled it together. And what we're again having, our, having to do in this situation is address those things and come to understand as we reflect off one another. The things that I really hate about uh, my relationship with my wife is simply the fact that she points out those things to me. You know, I mean, if, if I'm being irritable or I'm being short or I'm being critical or negative or any of those things, she automatically will pick up on that and she'll say to me, you know, you need to really kind of step back and really evaluate your attitude right now because it's not, it's not positive. And, you know, I don't want to deal with it. You know, when you're in a bad place mentally or psychologically or whatever, the last thing you want is somebody to tell you, I don't like your attitude. But that's also one of the most important things that we can have because of that feedback that we get from one another. Now, I know some of you are sitting and saying, that's all I get is negative feedback. Okay, we'll deal with that too as we go on further. But let me just simply say that the last thing I want to emphasize is that when God says a man becomes one with his wife and he leaves his parent and he cleaves to his wife, uh, the original language is really strong here. The idea of leaving means it's a complete separation. It's cut off. And what it means is that he cleaves to his wife. It means he becomes fastened together to her so tightly that you can't find a seam between the two parts. They're literally laminated together and become one. 
that becomes the point of greatest fulfillment and happiness. But the space between leaving and cleaving in all of our lives is pretty wide. And if you're going through some really difficult challenges right now in your relationship, that's where you're at right now. <clears throat> and there are a lot of things that determine how wide or how close you are. It's one of the reasons we encourage couples to go through premier marital counseling. And, and in many ways, even marital counseling that we've done sometimes comes back to kind of going through premarital counseling all over again because you didn't get it in the first place. But these are some of the things that we want to address and we want to speak to. And so the way we're going to handle this as we go forward, Lord willing, is I want to be able to share some insights on some of these concepts each week so that you can begin to reflect on them. And then I would ask that you would send us questions. You can send it at the pastor at calvaryspokane.com address. You can just click on that if you want to on our website or wherever. But it's a real simple address, pastor at calvaryspokane.com. And just send your questions in and, and we'd be more than happy to, basically I'll try to respond to them as we go through uh, these weeks together. Because I wanna be able to speak to real life issues that you're dealing with and not just theoretical things. Because there are so many things that can go wrong in our lives that, um, you know, I, I don't wanna be talking about things that aren't hitting you right at this moment. So we're gonna do that. We've already got a few questions that are coming in. And so next week we'll, we'll begin with those questions and we'll take them, cover them as we can in order. And, and eventually, Lord willing, we'll get through all of them. But again, I, I really wanna encourage you to um, really as a husband and wife in particular, that you might want to just sit down and, and talk if you're able to talk without becoming angry and having conflict, that you would simply talk together about what did you get out of this? What did you hear? I get it if this is too sensitive right now. I get it if it's too tender and I don't want to push you to do something. If it's a comfortable thing to do, then do it. If it's really too touchy right now that basically you're too uptight with each other, um, then just you know, take in and process what you've heard. I'll just give you a hint, ladies. One of the things you find is it takes men longer to think, figure out what they're thinking than it does women. You know, women kind of automatically know what they're thinking. Uh, and your husband isn't trying to, uh, to diss you or to push you away when he says, well, I don't know what I think about that. No, that's, that's pretty normal. It, it takes a long time. And I'll explain why that is, some of the brain dynamics that make that the way it is. But I'm really looking forward to this, being able to continue this conversation with you. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I hope it's going to be a lot of fun. I hope it's going to, more importantly, bring a lot of healing into your heart and your home. And, and, and in generally, even if you're not a married person, to learning how to relate and communicate with other people more effectually. So God bless you and go in his grace. <laughs>